Hi everyone, um, today we're excited to have Dr. Ying Zhu, um, an assistant professor at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, um, speaking to us about her work on the thermospheric winds and aurora dynamics. So Ying is an expert in the study of magnetic reconnection, aurora dynamics, and um, thermosphere circulation using a wide range of instruments, um, both ground-based and onboard spacecraft. She started her um, career at Peking University, um, studying for a BA in space physics, before going on to complete a PhD at the University of California in Los Angeles. And following her PhD, she was a recipient of the prestigious Jack Eddy Postdoc Fellowship, which she carried out at the Center for Space Physics at Boston University, um, before starting her current role as assistant professor in the fall of 2019 at the Center for Space, Plasma and Aeronomic Research at UAH. So today, she'll be presenting her work on the response of upper thermospheric winds to auroral and subauroral dynamics. So we're really excited to learn more on this topic. So thank you, Ying, and um, we're ready whenever you're ready. Thank you for the nice introduction. Yep, I'm Ying from University of Alabama in Huntsville. And as Emma said, uh, the topic I'm going to cover today is the response of upper thermospheric winds to aurora and subaurora dynamics. Um, so this is an outline. Um, I'm going to start the introduction with the importance of thermospheric winds, like why do we care? I will then talk about the circulation pattern of upper thermospheric winds. And this pattern to a large extent is driven by forcing on a planetary scale, like, like Donji cycle. A question then rises whether thermospheric winds respond to forcing at smaller scale, which we refer to as mesoscale. And as we'll see, the answer is controversial. The controversy uh, leads us to the motivation and the data set. And in the results section, I'm going to talk about winds associated with three regional slash mass scale processes. They are individual aurora forms, substorms, and subaurora polarization streams, SAPs. And then we will discuss the implication of the results and come to the summary. So winds are essentially just the motion of neutrals and they are important in many ways. Here I highlight three with the first being the impact on thermospheric mass density and composition. A frequently used parameter to characterize compositional perturbation is the ratio between N2 and O number density. Temperature is the main controlling factor of this ratio, but winds also play a role. The figure on the right shows the magnetic latitude uh, profile of this N2O ratio um, during two different geomagnetic conditions. And this ratio have been normalized to the quiet time reference. So we can see that at high latitude, let's say above 60 degree, the N2O ratio is enhanced from one. And this enhancement is due to local heating, specifically dual heating and a particle precipitation causes upwelling, which brings heavier constituents such as N2 to higher altitude. At middle altitude, let's say 40 to 60 degree, the ratio is also enhanced. This enhancement cannot be explained by local heating because this is well equatorward of the region one or region two fueling currents. Instead, this enhancement is due to the transport effect of winds, um, specifically the heating at high, out, um, at high latitude drives equatorward directed pressure gradient force, which forces the wind equatorward and to carry the compositional perturbation at high um, latitude to mid latitude. The second importance is about the impact on ionospheric densities. Um, in fact, the N2O ratio already has an influence on the density because the ionospheric, uh, I mean, the electron production is essentially the photoionization of atomic oxygen and the loss rate is proportional to the density of um, molecular nitrogen. So by changing the N2O ratio, winds can affect the ionospheric densities. But this slide shows an even more direct impact of winds. 
So as wind blow, it push plasma to move with them because of collisions. But plasma is constrained to move parallel to the magnetic field. So if we have a field line that's oblique to the Earth's surface and in the presence of meridional winds, um, the plasma will be pushed upward or downward depending on the wind direction while um, this through, I, I mean, when they have the collisions with winds. And if the plasma is forced upward, they come to a region where the air is more tenuous and the recombination loss of plasma is reduced. And therefore the plasma density is going to change. The third impact is on uh, main sphere ionosphere coupling, uh, or more specifically, the jewel heating and the field line currents. So winds play a role um, in jewel heating because when computing the jewel heating, J dot E, the electric fields should be taken in the reference frame of the neutrals, which is the sum of electric field in the Earth's reference frame and the U cross B, U represent the neutral velocity. When expanding this square, we arrive at three terms. The first term is a jewel heating in absence of any winds. And the second and the third terms represent the modification due to winds. And this polar plot shows the modification uh, in the simulation. And overall, we can see the modification is negative. So that means that wind tend to counteract the heating effect of plasma convection. Winds affect the uh, field line currents, uh, again, because the Peterson and Hall currents uh, should be calculated in the reference frame of neutrals. And the equation on the right shows, um, kind of separate the field line current contribution from the motion of neutrals versus the motion of plasma. And this contribution of neutrals is presented at the right figure. Here, the contribution can, both, uh, can be both positive and negative. But if we compare this distribution against the contribution due to plasma motion, we find that the field line currents due to winds tend to flow in the opposite direction. So this again suggests that winds have a negative effect on um, the MI coupling. So therefore, winds are important because of its impact on thermosphere, on ionosphere, as well as MI coupling. So how are winds uh, distributed at high um, latitudes? Here show three polar plots of wind um, circulation pattern at three different geomagnetic activity level. We see a very pronounced clockwise, a clockwise cell centered in the dusk sector with anti-sunward wind across a polar cap and a sunward wind at a lower latitude. Um, this dusk cell intensifies and expands with Kp. And um, the lack of a pronounced dawn cell is because the sunward winds in the dawn sector are much weaker than the sunward winds at the dusk sector. And this is due to the different effect of the Coriolis force. So specifically in the Northern hemisphere, the Coriolis force tend to deflect neutrals to the right. So for a sunward wind at dawn, this means a deflection towards equatorward, um, forcing wind away from the strong sunward ion forcing. On contrary, at dusk, the deflection is in the polar direction. So neutrals still stay within the region where the ion forcing is strong. And if we have simultaneous aurora measurements, uh, we can put the circulation pattern in the context of aurora oval methodology. Um, these are four different events. The aurora images are color coded in this orange scale and the arrows represent the wind velocities. So the anti-sunward winds occur in the polar cap where the plasma convection is sunward. And the sunward winds occur in the aurora oval where the plasma convection is also sunward. So this indicates that the wind circulation pattern to a large extent is driven by the planetary scale ionospheric convection. And of course, we can also see the dawn dusk asymmetry in the sunward winds in the aurora zone as we just discussed in the previous slide. 
However, we know that plasma convection is more than a two-cell pattern. It has complex structures embedded in the two-cell pattern. And uh, examples include convection channels in association with aurora arcs, spatial temporal dependent convection during substorms, and a sub aurora polarization streams, SAPs. The figure on the left shows an example of convection around an aurora streamer that's traversed by DMSP spacecraft. And this bottom figure shows the horizontal perturbation of, I mean, the perturbation of horizontal magnetic field, as well as um, the convection velocity in red. So we can see a convection channel, um, the negative. Velocity means that the plasma was directed equatorward, and this convection channel um, was bonded by a pair of upward and downward field line currents, and upward field line currents is what gave rise to this aurora streamer. The figure on the right shows a plasma convection or superposed plasma convection during substorm at a given um, magnetic local time. Um, before the onset, we can see the plasma convection is accelerated in the zonal direction, forming a strong shear with convection in the polar cap. Following the onset, um, the plasma convection in the aurora zone drastically reduces and rotates from the zonal to the meridional direction, relaxing this shear. So, the question becomes, do thermospheric winds respond to these localized and transient ionospheric processes? Um, well, the answer is controversial. Um, in the following, I'm going to present evidence um, suggesting no or little wind response, as well as evidence suggesting significant wind response. So here comes the first evidence suggesting no or little wind response. Um, this is based on the ion neutral coupling time constant. So if we only consider ion drag, meaning neglecting the Coriolis force, the pressure gradient force, the momentum advection, uh, the momentum equation reduced to this very simple form. And the solution to this equation is that the wind will approach plasma velocity exponentially. We can therefore define the ion neutral coupling time as the E-folding time. And this E-folding time, um, as you can imagine, depends on the number density of ions, number density of neutrals, and the ion neutral collision frequency. So here, uh, the figure shows the result of this coupling time. From top to bottom, we have the velocity vectors of ions and the neutrals. We have the temperature of electron, ion, and the neutral. We have the number density of neutrals and uh, electrons, and at the bottom shows the coupling time. We find that the lower the plasma density, the longer the coupling time, and overall the coupling time varies from 50 to 180 minutes. This is a very long coupling time. It means that persistent forcing is needed to drive substantial winds, and this would preclude many transient processes. For example, aurora arcs usually last a few to a few tens of minutes. Substorm, I mean, the expansion and recovery phase lasts about uh, one to two hours. Subs can last for a few hours, which may appear to be sufficiently long lasting. But remember, the plasma density is low at subs as the ionospheric trough. So possibly, the E folding time at sub aurora latitude is much longer than the three hour suggested here. This is another evidence supporting little or no wind response. The figure shows the superposed wind perturbation during substorms as measured by CHAMP. So as the CHAMP spacecraft orbits, it measures winds across a wide um, latitude range. So the X axis is latitude. The y-axis is a perturbation relative to the pre-substorm value. The different lines represent the wind perturbation during the first, the second, and the third orbits. And in all three orbits, we find that the wind perturbation is very small, like 20 minute, a meter per second. And this means that wind, I mean, substorms probably cannot perturb the motion of neutrals much. 
On the other hand, there are evidence supporting wind can show significant response to transient and localized forcing. This is an observation based on scanning Doppler imager, which essentially measure winds across the entire field of view. Um, the aurora are colored, coded in red, and these arrows again are the wind vectors. So at the beginning, a sequence of east-west aurora arcs form and they progress equatorward. During this time, wind was um, become weaker gradually. The drastic wind response occurred at T3, where there appeared to be an aurora breakup event. So here, the wind starts to rotate its direction from the previously nearly polarward directed to westward directed. And this reorientation or rotation starts almost immediately uh, with the aurora breakup and reach a quasi steady state within 15 minutes. So this is a prompt response to aurora breakup. Aurora breakup is a signature of substorm, and this slide focus on wind perturbation during substorms. From top to bottom, we have aurora observation as a function of latitude, the zonal wind, um, the acceleration rate of the zonal wind, the meridional wind, and the acceleration of the meridional wind. And it is obvious that wind has shown a significant perturbation, like 200 meter per second. Um, as a note, I guess to me, something one to 200 meter per second for winds is already significant. Something like low tens of minutes per second, I would regard as not so significant. So the perturbation here is about 200 meter per second or so. And um, for the zonal component, there's this, um, eastward acceleration in the late recovery, uh, late growth phase, um, expansion phase, and early recovery phase. And as for the meridional component, there's this southward acceleration in the late growth phase. Okay, so all these observations so far are based on the aurora zone. What about sub-aurora latitudes? Um, at sub-aurora latitude, one important process is subs, which is intense sunward flows occurring equatorward of aurora oval. They occur because the ionospheric conductance is low and to maintain a sufficiently large horizontal current needed for current closure, the electric field has to be large. So the figure on the right shows the wind perturbation during a SUPS event. From top to bottom, we have IMFBZ, SIMH, and this is the magnetic latitude distribution of the MSP observation, like the energy flux, ion velocity. The bottom panel shows the MLT, uh, not MLT, magnetic latitude distribution of wind taken from Gochi. Um, in this color scale, red indicates sunward, blue is anti sunward. Um, so winds flow anti sunward in the polar cap and a sunward in the aurora zone, which is consistent with what, with what we just said. But interestingly, the wind, the sunward wind extend equatorward of the aurora precipitation. So aurora precipitation is essentially limited to 55 degree or so, but wind extend far equatorward. And when we look at this ion velocity measured by DMSP, it suggests that the winds occur in association with saps. Um, so this event occur during a storm time and actually quite a significant storm. So a response, a response from wind is not totally unexpected because subs is strong and is long lasting. Um, the real question is, do wind respond to non-storm subs when subs is weaker and shorter lasting? Um, so motivated by those controversial evidence, here is a question we are interested in understanding. Um, do thermospheric winds respond to localized and transient ionospheric processes, such as auroras, substorms, and non-storm subs? If yes, how do the perturbed wind look like? Um, if no, why the wind show no response? The instrument we use is called a scanning Doppler imager. It essentially has the same working principle as Fabry-Parrot interferometer 
in terms of resolving the spectrum of the incoming emissions. But the difference is that a scanning Doppler imager can measure winds simultaneously over tens of directions across the fish uh, eye lens. But the traditional fabric parrot from interferometer has a very narrow field of view. And in order to obtain a, a wind field, the interferometer has to rotate its looking direction across the sky, which means that it will mix spatial and temporal variation of neutrals. And also the SDI has a better time resolution, like one to five minutes, as opposed to like 30 minutes of the traditional FPI. Um, but anyway, so the incoming emissions, after resolving the spectrum of the incoming emissions, the Doppler shift gives the line of sight wind speed, which under certain assumptions can further be converted to wind vectors. And the broadening of this emission indicates temperature. The main emission we use is the red line, which presumably comes from an altitude about 250 kilometer, which is the upper thermosphere. And, um, and we mainly use SDI deployed over Alaska area because this is a prime location for studying the night side aurora dynamics and sub aurora dynamics. And also at Alaska, we have um, all sky, like aurora measurements from all sky imagers, as well as plasma measurements from Pfizer, which allow us to understand the wind in the context of aurora as well as plasma convection. So here we are going to talk about winds associated with individual aurora forms. Um, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> three different aurora forms. Um, the first one is east-west aligned aurora arc, and then aurora streamers, and then westward traveling surge. The east-west aurora arc can be long lasting, I mean longer than one hour. So these are these four snapshots show the emergence and the development of the east-west aurora arc. The auroras are shown in this gray scale. The red arrows represent the wind vectors, and the cyan arrows represent the plasma convection from Pfizer. For both the red and the cyan color, um, if you look carefully, there are little dots. Those are the base of the arrows. So the line gives the direction of the wind and the plasma. Um, before the appearance of the east-west aurora arc, um, the wind field is dominated by westward wind, and the intensity of the wind decreases with decreasing latitude. And then this east-west aurora arc, which appears as this white discrete structure, and the plasma convection at an equatorward of the aurora arc show a substantial westward acceleration. Wind immediately equatorward of the aurora arc, like these arrows, also show an enhancement in a westward direction. As time goes on, this westward wind becomes faster and faster, and eventually it becomes the fastest wind across all the latitude of our interest. This essentially means that we have a latitudinally narrow wind channel forming around the aurora arc. This sequence can be seen also from um, this time series plot. So from top to bottom, we have Aurora from Themis Olsky Imager, the zonal component of plasma, the zonal component um, of wind, and the very end, um, the comparison of plasma and the wind velocity at the same latitude. So in association with occurrence of R, plasma convection shows a westward acceleration. Um, the winds are also accelerated, where's my cursor? Here is also accelerated westward, and acceleration mainly occur at and just equatorward of the aurora arc, forming this a localized channel of fast wind. And if we compare the temporal evolution, we find that the wind acceleration starts almost the same time as the occurrence of the aurora arc and the plasma convection. Um, the difference is that it reaches its maximum perturbation um, at a later time. So we actually use the time lag between the plasma and the neutral reaching its peak to as a characterization of the wind response time, and that's shown here. So the black and the red shading region correspond to the time when neutral reach its maximum 
um, peak um, and the shading region consider the measurement uncertainty. And if we count the difference between the time when plasma and neutral reach the peak, the difference is not large. It's like 20 minutes plus minus six minutes or, or so. And this is significantly shorter than the one to several hour long um, ion neutral coupling time reported in literature. So this short time allow us to you know, investigate whether winds can uh, respond to transient aurora structures such as streamers. In this case, before the currents of streamer, the winds, I guess, polarward of this brightest arc were directed westward, and those equatorward were directed like west, I mean, south. I know, polarward are directed eastward, that those equatorward are directed southwestward. But this wind pattern starts to change when streamer uh, approaches or pass by the field of view. The second snapshots show a streamer penetrate to about 67 degree. And if we compare the wind measurements around 67 degree um, with the time before the aurora, I mean, before the appearance of streamer, we can see that winds gets enhanced east of the streamer. And then the streamer continued to penetrate to 65 degree. Now we see all the winds down to 65 degree are accelerated. Um, those equatorward of the streamer do not show much change. The first streamer then disappeared. We then have a second streamer, which penetrated to an even lower latitude. And uh, to, this is about 63 degree, let's say. And the wind uh, up down to this latitude, again, are substantially enhanced relative to the pre-streamer time, whereas those equatorward do not show much perturbation. And this again is supported in, uh, by this time series plot where these two streamers are associated with southward plasma convection. And um, the southward plasma convection is also associated with enhancement of southward winds. Um, and if we compare the time evolution of the wind and the plasma, it's very similar to before, the wind starts to accelerate southward nearly the same time as the plasma convection, as well as appearance of streamer, it just reaches the maximum a little late. But still, the, the time lag between neutrals versus plasma reaching the peak is like 10 minutes plus minus five minutes. So that's still a very fast response. Last but not least, um, we have the westward traveling surge. So at the before, so here the westward traveling surge um, approaches the field of view from right or from the east side and then pass through. So before the arrival of this westward traveling surge, we have this wind field where all the red vectors direct to the west. And then the um, westward traveling surge approaches and get close. We find that the plasma convection reverts its direction from previously westward directed to these eastward directed. And this is because the westward traveling surge is associated with kind of like a clockwise convection vortex, like represented by this cyan dashed arrow in front of the um, surge. And in association with this rotation of plasma convection, the wind, the previously westward directed wind, becomes significantly decelerated and eventually turned to eastward directed in the same direction as the plasma flow. And then the westward traveling surge passed by, uh, both the plasma and the wind return to westward directed. Um, this process is again supported by the time series plot. You can see the reversal of plasma convection from west to east and then back to west. And all these process happen well within one hour, like half an hour, but wind still capture the perturbation very well with a significant perturbation like 190 meter per second. And we can further characterize the time lag between plasma and wind reaching the maximum this is again about 10 minutes plus minus a few minutes. So to recap what we have learned about winds associated with individual aurora forms, 
we find winds are closely coupled to the aurora and the plasma convection around the aurora. They, ex um, they show distinct spatial structures. For example, around east-west aurora arc, um, wind contain a latitudinally narrow channel of fast flow for aurora streamer. They have longitudinally narrow and propagating channels of fast winds. For westward traveling surge, we have the wind reversed from the background westward direction to the eastward direction. And in terms of the temporal evolution of winds, um, the wind evolution looks very similar to the plasma flow. It reaches maximum perturbation by 20 minutes or less behind the plasma flow. So now we are going to look at whether wind responds to substorms. And in the introduction, we show evidence supporting winds either respond or do not respond at all to substorms. Here, we essentially follow the same methodology of how we study winds response to individual aurora forms. We just compare winds before and after the substorm onset. But there are two minor difference. First, substorm is much larger in scale compared with individual aurora forms. So in correspondence, we compare, we require um, simultaneous operation of at least two uh, SDIs. In that way, we have a broad latitudinal coverage, like 15 degree, to cover the entire aurora oval. The second minor difference is that we only care about the perturbation from the quiet time background. So we essentially construct um, a quiet time wind um, climatology distribution and subtract it from the actual wind per observation. And the figure format is very similar to before. From top to bottom, we have a UAL index, aurora observation. We have the plasma measurement from Pfizer and zonal wind from two SDIs. It's straightforward that winds show a significant response after uh, following the onset. Um, specifically, before the onset, winds at the overall latitude were directed westward. Winds equatorward of the overall oval were very weak. Um, following the onset, wind, the previously westward wind, now turned eastward, and the previously stagnant sub overall wind become westward directed. And these perturbations are like one to 200 meter per second from the quiet time value. So this is a quite significant perturbation. So that is simple and straightforward. But as we continue to collect more event, we soon realize this is not the only type of wind perturbation we are going to have. So this event shows a different type of, or different, yeah, it's different type of wind perturbation. So before the onset, again, the bottom two panels shows the perturbed wind. Um, at the overall latitude, the winds were directed eastward, but winds um, equatorward of the aurora oval were directed westward. And following the onset, the eastward directed wind turned westward, and the westward wind at sub aurora latitude turns eastward. So this perturbation is essentially in the opposite sense to the previous one. So here, let's say before the onset, we have blue color, which is eastward at the top and red at the bottom. And if we go back, there's red at the top and well, little perturbation at the bottom. Following the onset, we have red at the top, blue at the bottom. And if we go back, we have blue at the top, red at the bottom. So again, this is in the opposite sense. The wind perturbation here are slightly weaker, but still like 100 meter per second from the quiet time condition. The variety of wind response continues. In fact, we have identified six different types of wind response. Um, so this slide show the superposed um, analysis of wind perturbation, including both the zonal component and the meridional component. The reference time, like zero time, it's uh, the substorm onset, and the reference latitude is the substorm onset latitude. The two events we just mentioned are taken from the middle rule, where uh, kind of like wind shear develops um, following the onset 
and these wind shears are in opposite sense. For the very first type and the very last type of perturbation, the winds show westward and eastward acceleration over a broad latitude range without a clear shear. For type three, we have westward acceleration, but this acceleration is mostly below zero, so like at sub aurora latitude. Above zero, the acceleration, um, I mean, compared with quiet time, is very small. And for type four, I guess, aurora and sub aurora latitude both show little acceleration. Another, um, I guess, feature to note is that for the bottom roll, um, all these three types of perturbation show significant southward acceleration, but um, this southward acceleration is absent in the first roll. So that sounds confusing and overwhelming. And, but when we start to organize the wind perturbation according to the MLT of the measurements, a coherent picture starts to emerge. So this is a cartoon summarizing that coherent picture. The left shows the perturbation uh, relative to the quiet time before the substorm onset. So this is like the growth phase. And this is a perturbation after the substorm onset. Before the onset, um, we see enhanced sunward circulation. And um, this enhancement occurs mostly occur uh, like at or polarward of the onset longitude, uh, latitude. At dawn, this sunward acceleration is further um, deflect deflected towards um, south, which probably is due to the Coriolis effect. After the substorm onset, the pattern, the wind um, in how, like the wind perturbation can be categorized in two groups. First is outside the shading region. Outside the shading region, we also see an enhancement of the sunward circulation, but compared with the growth phase, this uh, enhancement occurs over a broader latitude and local time range. But within this shading region, we don't see much zonal perturbation. Um, instead, we may only have the southward perturbation. So why we have this weird shading region with suppressed zonal perturbation. Well, if we look at the ionospheric convection during substorm, a similar shading region has also been found. So the figure on the left shows the um, kind of like substorm driven plasma convection. And this dark or the black region um, highlights an area where the zonal convection is weak or very structured. So outside this shading region, again, the plasma was um, kind of like accelerated in the sunward direction. Therefore, there's a high degree of similarity between the plasma zonal motion versus the wind zonal motion. And this suggests that the ion drag or the momentum of ions is a driver of the zonal wind. You may wonder why we have this suppression in the ionospheric convection. And if we compare this against with uh, ionospheric conductance, this region actually overlaps with the high conductance area. So because you know, conductance and electric field come hand in hand in carrying electric jet, when we have a very high conductance, the electric field doesn't need to be high in that area. So therefore, there is weak plasma convection and a weak ion drag. So, prob so probably that's why the, we have weak winds um, in the shading region. Um, and uh, the difference between the wind and the plasma convection is mostly the southward wind in the dawn sector. And that's probably due to dual heating, Coriolis force, um, those effects. Okay. So we talked about activities at aurora latitude, now moving on to sub aurora latitudes. So um, here we study the, we focus on non-storm subs because as we said, um, non-storm subs is weaker and more transient. The, right, the, the left column shows AE index aurora from two different panels and um, the superdome measurement measured winds. 
uh, not wind, <laughs> the super dark measure plasma convection. The equator where boundary of the overall oval is highlighted by this um, black dashed curve and is also overlaid um, on top of supernova. We can see the plasma convection equatorward of the overall boundary, so that is SAPS. The right column shows um, the SDI measured in aurora intensity, wind, uh, like zonal wind, marginal wind, and a neutral temperature. We find that the westward wind extend from the aurora oval all the way to sub-aurora latitude, and that indicates effect of SAPS. And these sub aurora winds are quite significant with a velocity about 150 meter per second. But we only see zonal perturbation. We don't see perturbation in the meridional or um, in the neutral temperature. So that probably suggests there's a little Coriolis force and the heating effect is not quite as strong. But does this happen all the time? Um, actually, no. So this is a different event where, again, we have subs occurring equatorward of the overall oval. But if we look at a zonal wind, they are mostly confined within the overall oval. The velocity quickly decrease um, as, it, like, as we go to a lower latitude. In fact, if we kind of like characterize, like measure the wind velocity here and use um, our threshold, let's say 50 meter per second as a significant wind, then this event falls onto the category where there's no significant wind. And similar to before, there's little meridional wind, little heating effect. So this actually is an event where subs have insignificant impact on um, winds. So we continue to investigate the occurrence and the controlling factor of subs related winds versus you know, winds not like no winds being uh, driven by SAPs. And here's our results. Um, so we think the AE may play a role because SAPs becomes stronger when AE is larger. So um, stronger SAPs probably is a cause of significant wind response. And this is indeed supported by this, um, the left figure um, by the blue red indicate SAPs did not successfully drive, um, drive significant wind, but the red indicates there is subs related wind. The ratio between the blue and red um, is large for small AE, meaning that occurrence of subs wind is low. But as you go, let's say to two to 400 um, AE, I mean, nano Tesla in AE, um, there's more subs related wind. And if you go even higher, if we can trust these data points, the occurrence become even more significant. We think that the TEC value may also play a role because this is a proxy of ionospheric density. The higher the density, uh, I mean, the more frequent collisions between ions and the neutrals, so stronger wind. Um, I guess this is partly supported um, because for very small, because I, I mean, subs related winds can occur for a wide range of TEC, but for very small TEC value, let's say less than four TEC unit, the occurrence is low. And then we think MLT may also play a role because um, in addition to ion drag, uh, pressure gradient force also controls the motion of neutrals. And um, around like the day-night temperature gradient actually forms a pressure gradient force that opposes um, the ion drag of SAPS. So maybe around the terminator where the temperature difference is large, we will have a lower chance of seeing subs related wind. And this is again supported in this figure where let's say earlier than 20 MLT or closer to the terminator, the occurrence of subs related wind is low. But if you go to um, like later in the nighttime, the subs occurrence um, wind, like the subs related wind occurrence um, is elevated. So to recap, subs at times drive substantial westward wind at sub latitude, but not always. And the currents varies with AE, the plasma content in the trough and the local time. And we also see sub, we, we also didn't see subs to be related to polar wind surge, neutral temperature enhancement, or traveling atmospheric disturbances. 
but these features have been observed during storm time subs. So this probably reflects that our subs is just too weak for these um, phenomenon to rise. Okay, so I'm going to use the very last few minutes um, to quickly discuss the implication of the results. First is, you know, at least at aurora latitudes, we find winds are closely coupled to um, auroras down to time scale well below one hour. But if you remember in literature, the response time is one to several hour. So how can we reconcile um, this very different time scale? This slide show an updated estimate of uh, ion neutral coupling time. The author compare or correlate the wind with the plasma measurement um, taken at the same time. And the left figure shows the lag that gives the, um, or the co cross correlation coefficient as a function of the lag between plasma and the neutrals. We can see that the lag that gives the highest correlation overall peak around like 75 minute or so, but that's not for all the curves. Some curves have a peak very short, like these here have a peak around 15 minutes. So this is also illustrated on this right figure, which shows the kind of like lag time, the distribution of lag time over the entire SDI field of view. Despite the overall mid-shade green color, there are regions where the coupling time is very small, like, like what we said, 15 minutes. So this indicates that ion neutral coupling strengths can be enhanced significantly at massive scale. And one candidate for the enhancement is aurora precipitation because more ionospheric density means more frequent ion neutral collisions. So as far as we know, our study is probably the first reporting that SAPs may not affect thermospheric winds. Apart, that, apart from you know, our emphasis on non-storm time, which is known to be weaker than storm, storm time SAPs, another factor that may lead to our weaker response is the universal time dependent um, effect. So the time when SAPs occur is like, is important because the solar illumination at the dusk sector at a given latitude is different at a different universal time due to the offset between the geographic and geomagnetic pole. And if you have an area that's more solar illuminated, you will have higher ionospheric density, again, more frequent ion neutral collisions. And this figure shows the simulation of um, kind of like the evolution of subs driven wind. Um, yeah, like when subs occur at different times. So the x axis is the epoch time. So subs starts at zero and reaches its peak at the black dash line and stops at the blue line. And different um, curves represent subs commences at a different time. So we find that subs occurring at different times produce winds of very different amplitudes. And in the Northern hemisphere, the strongest wind occur like this orange curve. So that's, is about 18 to 20 hour um, universal time. And the weakest wind response occur about four universal time. And because we use measurements at Alaska, our subs observation are limited to like six to 11 or 10 universal time. And therefore, if we look at these curves, those are the blue and cyan ones, which are on the weaker end of the spectrum. Last but not least, um, so can we simulate these winds um, through simulations? The short answer is it is very difficult. Um, this study explores um, the ability of Geaton model to simulate winds during soft storms. So multiple simulation runs have been performed with different high latitude drivers. Um, for example, the electric potential driver can be Weimar or superdarn potential. The aurora precipitation can be the NOAA precipitation model, ovation SME or ovation um, prime here. And the, this figure shows the zonal wind um, from four different simulations. 
And you can see that the thermospheric winds are critically sensitive to high latitude drivers used in simulations. And when comparing against observation, different drivers have different strengths and weakness. So it's hard to say which driver works better than others. In short, um, we need very accurate specification of the convection and the aurora precipitation in order to reproduce the wind structures. And at this moment, we are just not there yet. So here is the summary. I think I'm already a little over time. So the take home message is that the ionosphere thermosphere coupling at the aurora zone is very tight. And this is partially due to the aurora precipitation. But at sub aurora latitude, the level of coupling is variable. It can change with AE, um, um, the TEC or the plasma content, um, the magnetic local time, and possibly universal time. So that's all what I want to cover, and I'm happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you, Ying. I think we should give her a round of applause. <laughs> How virtually as well, the reactions. But yeah, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ying? Ah, I can see some raised hands. I think, um, Bill, you've got your hands raised. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, always appreciate your very clear presentations, Ying. Thank you. Um, thank you. I wonder if you can say something about the uh, altitude profile of the ion neutral coupling, uh, in particular um, in relation to electron precipitation. So the, the soft electron precipitation uh, will enhance the electron density and, and then presumably the ion density at higher altitudes than the uh, harder electron precipitation, which is going to modify the E region. Um, and I, I don't recall you saying very much about the altitude profile of the winds. Can you say something about that? Give some insights into what, what you think about it? This is actually a very hard question. So the altitude distribution is, um, first, it's very hard to measure observationally. Um, so that's why we, have, we don't have too much information. Um, so the region we are interested in is the upper thermosphere. And often we assume that in the upper thermosphere, wind do not vary too much with altitude. In contrast, if that's why I guess I never men mentioned the lower thermosphere. The lower thermosphere is where, um, based on rockets and other measurements, there seems to be very sharp gradient, even within a short altitude range. And we don't really have a very clear profile. I, Remember, there is a graph that kind of like shows the superposed wind, like the altitudinal profile of wind. And when you overlay all the graphs together, it essentially looks like noise. It's just very messy. But the altitude distribution is a very important um, and interesting point. I think maybe the area we potentially understand a little better is at the cusp. Um, so at the cusp, we have that, uh, what they call the cusp density anomaly which if you fly a spacecraft at 400, you will see great density enhancement. But if you fly a spacecraft at 250 kilometer, you don't see the density enhancement. So one explanation is maybe the wind, I mean, the heating effect occurs above E region, but like, uh, like somewhere in F region. So that's why at a lower altitude, you don't see this heating. Um, and how winds affect that, um, I don't know. But I recall Con like Mark Condy, once he studied the cusp wind and find that he couldn't find any evidence supporting a divergence of wind, which may um, support a density perturbation um, even at higher in the, within the upper thermosphere. So I would say, yep, this is a pretty much an area of open question. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think we have um, a raised hand from Eric. Hi, yes. Um, uh, your, your mention of the cusp density anomaly was something I was going to bring up to segue into my question, which is that uh, um, thinking that uh, when I worked on the 
uh, did some work on the cusp density and anomaly is that uh, it was related to small scale waves, which were got much smaller than the models could resolve. And, uh, and that was why the models were missing this phenomenon. Is it possible that some of the differences between the modeling and observations and the difficulty that the models have, could that be related to some subgrid physics in the uh, in the uh, 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 neutral wind driving that could cause things to be more closely coupled than the models would pick up or earlier data sets were indicating? I think that's definitely very possible. So like the wave you mentioned, so like, um, I think this comes from the correlation of the cusp density anomaly with those like very highly fluctuating magnetic field observed at the cusp. Yet some people think that that can be interpreted as field line currents and field lock, or they think this is probably alphanic wave. Um, so the field line, I guess, yeah, these bring very different, like this cause heating at very different regions. Like if we assume those are electrostatic electric field fluctuations, then those heating will primarily occur at E region. Um, but if we assume they are waves, the majority of the um, energy deposition will occur in F region. Um, so therefore understanding these kind of like smaller scale physics is, I would say really change where the heating occur and therefore the density, like the upwelling, downwelling, um, the horizontal circulation of winds, um, all these things. And um, yeah, and I, I think there's is a trend that we start to appreciate the energy coming at different um, spatial scales. I think there have been studies showing that from the ionosphere energy input perspective, there's like something like 20% actually comes from massive scale rather than large scale. And possibly if we extend further down to even smaller scale, we will realize there is a component coming from the smaller scale as well. All right, thank you. Okay, I can see a question in the chat from Jason. Um, it reads, um, have you seen any evidence of modification of the thermospheric winds in the vicinity of auroral beads? That's a very good question. I guess I never really pay attention to it. Um, but um, I mean, aurora bits have been realized to associate it with very high um, plasma density, but not <laughs> plasma velocity, like based on super dark measurements. So considering that there is large ion momentum, large ion precipitation, I don't see why winds um, cannot respond to those bees. I guess the only concern is that the variation of bees may change too rapid for wind to respond because at least um, based on the current evidence, the response time of wind is still like 10 minutes to 20 minutes. I haven't seen a report that's much smaller on this time scale though. Okay, and I think we have time for one more because I know we've run over, but we started late. So Roger, you have your hand up. Yeah, th thank you, Ying, for that very nice talk. In a lot of your discussion of the time scales, you're focusing on the ion drag coupling, mm -hmm. uh, but in particularly in the substorms, there's also a lot of joule heating leading to pressure increases. So what are the characteristic time scales for the the heating to change the pressure gradients and then for the pressure gradients to change the wind? That's a very good question. We focus on ion drag because it's the most, uh, is easily to be measured. Pressure gradient, because it relates to the gradient, is not something we can easily um, obtain from, I guess, from the observation. But if you, if I just want to guess without any evidence, I would think the pressure gradient would be comparable, if not faster uh, overall than the ion drag. And the reason is just because I think heating occurs potentially on a shorter time scale than wind is like you start, you essentially start to see upwelling or downwelling um, 
around the same time when heating starts. But that's just my guess. I, I really don't have any evidence <laughs> supporting myself. <laughs> yeah, th this is something that I think could deserve some dedicated modeling. You could conceivably do a simulation where you uh, switched off the heating versus the ion drag and, and isolated the two effects. I absolutely agree. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Um, do we have any other last questions? If not, I think we should thank Ying again. And thank you so much for speaking to us today. It was great and you sparked a, a really great discussion. Thank you.